Today we know that uh, uh, more than uh, 90 per percent of the people that start the first line uh, regimen achieve virological suppression. And this is due mainly to the acknowledging to have uh, very new potent drugs uh, that can uh, target uh, all almost uh, step of the viral uh, replication. And uh, this is for instance uh, what we have in Italy. There is a, a large court uh, of um, naive patients that are enrolled in this uh, ICONA court that today we have more than 15,000 of patients and are followed during the time. You see that uh, in the, before the 2000, uh, of course, uh, the achievement of virological suppression was very low, but uh, since 2010 is increased uh, and is around uh, 90% and uh, in the last uh, uh, new year, few years, uh, we have more than 95%. Uh, so it's very good. Uh, uh, success. But uh, not all the patients maintain uh, this virological success. So we have uh, the definition of uh, virological failure. For the American guidelines, the virological failure are all patients that does not achieve uh, the viral suppression below the 200 copies. For the European guidelines, the virological failure is two confirmed viral uh, load above 50 copies after starting uh, treatment. And uh, also Italian guidelines uh, suggest uh, that uh, after 24 weeks uh, of starting treatment, if uh, there are two consecutive uh, viral load above 50, excuse me, 50 copy per ml is uh, a virological failure. You know the um, concern a little bit about the World Health Organization that still keep uh, as a virological failure the real definition that we are really sure that is a virological failure above uh, 1,000 copy. But still, uh, in the new guidelines, uh, they make an emphasis on importance to do the uh, viral load test. No, this is... So, what is important? That today, of course, uh, we can treat uh, our patient when they start, we can achieve a virological success, but very important is that this virological success is maintained for many years after just uh, the first uh, uh, year or two years. So it's very important to keep in mind all the factors that are influencing the long-term viral suppression. And so regarding the durability, first of all, we need always to think to see which is our patient in front of us, which could be the adherence, and how could be the convenience and tolerability to approach the different uh, drugs and regimens. According to the drug, we need always to remember that can be some adverse effect, the um, drug levels, uh, for the metabolism, but also the genetic barrier to develop resistance. And if we think about the virus, of course, we can have baseline mutation, we can have a resistance, primary resistance transmitted, and after uh, today will be several talks about uh, the resistance transmission in, um, also in, Ch in Chile, in Argentina, in other country here. And uh, also the baseline burden, so the HIV RNA and HIV DNA before starting treatment, of course, uh, can have uh, an effect uh, on the virological success. But we can say that the therapy inside today is very changed respect to the before. So before we were treating patients uh, to avoid that they were dying because uh, there was the first patients, you know, the eight patients that needed to be treated and hopefully uh, suppress uh, the viremia. But now we know that the treatment is lifelong for at least for decades, and the therapy is successful only if it's maintained it for decades and not only for months or for a few years. And we need to think about that in this era, it's very important the switch to new heart. That is not always a failure, but it's just a natural event in the course of long-term therapy. And of course, in some cases, due to failures, toxicity, intolerance, but also for simplification. And it's very important to preserve future therapeutic option and uh, it's important to avoid the emergence of resistance, of cross resistance, even if today the resistance issue can be less um, severe than uh, in the past. And so it's very important that our endeavor today has switched from treating the resistance virus to preventing its emergence and consolidation. And long-term success will require major attention in this uh, matter. And Unfortunately, we know that virological rebound still is a concern. So this is our Italian 
uh, database uh, uh, that uh, we see that after, by 96 weeks after achieving a virological success, uh, overall, uh, analyzing more than 1,600 patients, uh, the probability of virological rebound was uh, 70%, and the virological rebound was two consecutive viral load more than 50. And you see that this risk to have uh, high viral rebound uh, was more with the patients that started the treatment with the viral load, more than 500,000. So patients that have high viremia, of course, need a longer time to achieve virological suppression, and if they achieve virological suppression, they have more risk to have a virological rebound. But if we see virological rebound with viral load more than 200 copies, you see that the numbers is reduced to 12%. So what is important is that the majority of virological rebound show low-level viremia that represents still one of the most frequent reasons of uncertainty in the clinical decision. And this is, for instance, uh, um, a questionnaire that has um, the results show a few years ago in a conference uh, that they asked to the clinicians if the uh, patients have, uh, with optimal suppression, uh, normally the clinicians tend to see the patients uh, um, every four months or more than four months. But you see that if a patient has low-level viremia or some blip, so there is a concern, of course. And so some clinicians ask to see the patients again after one month, two months, three months, and a little bit less, of course, after four months. So it's an alert. No? If you see a viral blip, you tend to see the patients early. No. And um, so... No, so this is uh, the definition of virological failure. And we will see today during the um, speak, but of course if you read uh, already before uh, some uh, um, uh, manuscript about uh, this issue, we speak very frequently of patients that are in low-level viremia. So the definition of low-level viremia is uh, with a viral load between 50 and 500, but for several uh, groups also below 1,000. Viral blip is normally an episode when you have just one moment of a viral load that is above 50, that before were always below 50. We can have persistent low-level viremia, and very low-level viremia normally is the viremia that is below 50, but still is quantificable. And after we have the residual viremia that normally should be below 10 copies, meaning that still you have some virus, and we will see why, and normally is unaffected by treatment intensification. And after we have the real definition of virological failure, that is when the patients have really more than 100 copies, 1,000 copies, excuse me. And we can have also different level of virological rebound, and low level viral rebound is between 50 and 500 copies. So this is, you know, this is an example of viral blip, and this can be the persistence of low-level viremia between 50 and 500 copies, or very low-level viremia below 50 copy. The residual viremia, we know that can persist despite long-term virological success and is not uh, modified thanks to the intensification. And normally, how it occurs, this residual viremia? There are two mechanisms that have been uh, proposed. One is the ongoing virus replication, because Maybe in some compartment the drugs does not reach the good concentration level. So still you have a little bit of replication, and this can be also demonstrated by evolution of uh, uh, the virus. But you can have also the release of the virus by infected cells that are normally latently infected, but after just a stochastic antigenic simulation, they can release virus, but of course there is inhibition of reinfection to cells because we are doing the treatment. Normally, I think, and the majority of people think that the, both mechanisms are important for um, providing this uh, viremia uh, residual. We know also that uh, we can have transient low-level viremia, that sometimes in these patients can change from 50 to 400, and this can occur in 25, 40% of patients. And this, we have a lot of uh, papers about this uh, issue. But now, more recently, different uh, groups uh, show that when you have a very low-level viremia, so virus below the 50 copies, can be associated with virological failure. This is a work from Doyle and group of uh, Anna Maria Geletti in the UK. 
that you see that if you have a viral load with between 40 49, you have rise, high risk to have a virological rebound than in patients that have uh, um, HIV RNA below 40 or, of course, not detected. This is an Italian uh, paper from the north of Italy that also shows very nicely that there is a linear, linear relationship between the HIV RNA level and the risk of virological failure. And this is again by the group of uh, Geretti, this uh, opinion that very low level viremia on art can have a significance and management. So you see that if you have a viral load between 40 and 49, you have high risk to have a rebound above 50, but of course not so many with a viral rebound above 400. And this can decrease, of course, if you have patients with viral um, RNA below 40 or target not detected. And this is another paper from another group from Italy, from the north of Italy, from San Raffaele, that show again, uh, and you see the terminology here, the paper is about residual viremia, but the definition is below 50 copies, so in principle should be the very low level viremia, and again uh, is associated very nice with the risk of virological rebound and failure. This is another paper recently of um, one year ago, that show again, they try to understand the impact of uh, low-level viremia and the risk of uh, virological failure. And what you see here, that indeed, if a patient has uh, a viremia above uh, 200 copy, or they were treated with API based dual therapy or monotherapy, were associated with the virological uh, failure. What about uh, single viral blips uh, and how they can be associated with virological failure? This is again uh, a new paper that has been uh, published uh, recently that uh, show that uh, if a patient, uh, um, in comparison to patients that have always viral suppression below 20, so fully suppressed, you see that uh, if a patient have uh, very low level viremia, so between 20 and 49, or low level viremia between 50 and 190 copies, so always before, below 200, you don't see a difference uh, in the number of uh, risk of uh, virological rebound to consecutive uh, above 200. But indeed, if a patient have a viremic episode more than 200, you see that in this case you have a high risk to have a virological failure. When genotypic resistant tests should be performed in this case? So there are many, many of papers that describe and show that is very useful to use the resistant test also at low level viremia. So what the guidelines say about the genotypic resistant test? The American guidelines say that is really recommended when uh, HIV RNA is above 1,000 copy, but in patients that have a level more than 500, between 500 and 1,000, they also is important to do um, the resistant test, but maybe this uh, test is not uh, be, uh, successful. For the European uh, guidelines from EX, uh, also the mention is uh, that uh, all the patients that have a virological failure need to, de to do the resistant test, and also patients that have low viremia, viremia between 350 and 500 copy should be addressed to specific laboratory that they can do. These are our Italian guidelines that say that recommended all patients with a viral load above 200 and uh, in patients that have between 50 and 200 copies also should be uh, suggested, but of course we know that not all the laboratories can uh, perform and have a high level. This is the experience of uh, our uh, laboratory, and you see that uh, in the years uh, we have an increased number of resistant tests that have been requested over the years uh, for patients failing with low-level viremia. In 2013, you see that more than 30% of the patients have requested the clinician a resistant test with a viral load below 1,000. And what is important is that the genotypic resistant test, when you do and if it's successful, is um, reliable. And this is just, again, our uh, paper that has been published a few years ago that show that indeed when you have a viral load between 200 or above 500, you see a very high success rate of uh, the resistant test. While between 51 and 200, indeed, you have a little bit low success rate. But overall, we have a success rate more than 96%. And again, what is important that when you achieve the resistant test at low level, 
you see that frequently you can have, uh, you detect uh, the resistance. And also the resistance you detect uh, also in the patients that were failing just the first line regimen. So even a patient that first, uh, failed the first line regimen with a viral load below 200 or below 500, you see emergence of uh, resistance. Now we are using in the last uh, years also the integrase inhibitor um, and these are the first paper that was showing from the French group uh, that raltegravir resistance can be also served at a low level of varemia and uh, indeed also we uh, prove uh, the same uh, that there is an increasing of the presence of resistance according to the viral load. And what is interesting we did in this uh, uh, paper also to understand which was the genotypic susceptibility score after the, the patient's failure raltegravir treatment. And you see that according to the uh, viral load, you see a change of uh, the virus if it's resistant or not resistant. While for dolutegravir, luckily, the majority of the patients that failed raltegravir in this uh, court were uh, all, always susceptible to dolutegravir, just two patients have fully resistant virus and the viral load was uh, more than 1,000 copies. This is another French uh, paper that showed that when you have uh, an impact of low-level varemia, you have uh, an increase of drug resistance. And you can have uh, for all the mutation, for all the uh, drugs. Uh, and you see also for the integrase, integrase inhibitor, you see in this case uh, emergence of resistance that before was not present. So again, when you have a failing also with the low-level varemia, of course, you have development of uh, resistance. This is a, a paper from uh, the Canadian group, from um, the group of Richard Aragon, that showed the virological failure was faster and more common in patients with lower genotypic susceptibility score during low-level varemia. So they analyzed uh, around 1,700 patients that have, uh, f during their, um, their history, a low-level varemia, at least uh, um, the measurement with below 1,000 copies, and they were falling for four years, and they were looking at which was the uh, risk to have a real virological failure above 1,000. And you see in this graph that if the patients have persistence of low-level varemia with the GSS uh, low, like one, you see that there is a high risk to have a virological failure. And again, this, uh, the same group showed that both the drug resistance and the subtherapeutic plasma drug level have uh, both an impact uh, on the risk of subsequent virological failure. And more interesting, the patient with subtherapeutic plasma drug level, they accumulated for the drug resistance faster during follow-up. So we should always remember that long-life treatment dictate a switch. So how we can personalize treatment switch in virological suppressed patients? Again, there are many papers that suggest to use the HIV DNA genotypic resistant test for optimizing the therapy in both drug naive but especially in drug experienced patients. And this is again in our laboratory, the request of HIV DNA genotypic resistant test in the last years. And you see an increase, of course, and in the last years also an increase of resistant test for the integrase. So what about the impact of archived or historical resistance in virological suppressed patients that need to switch a therapy? So this is a, a, an abstract that has been presented last year in the International Resistance Meeting, but now is an updated version, that we show that patients that have in PBMC an intermediate or fully resistant, so the red bar, to, um, with the GSS to the regimen that has been administered for the switch after a patient that was with virological suppression, you see that there is a high risk of virological rebound instead of patients that have a virus fully susceptible. And also this is another paper that came out recently that we show that the pre-existing of both NRTI and NRTI resistance had a high probability of experiencing a virological rebound in patients that uh, switched to uh, um, a new therapy. So the treatment should be individualized and knowing the virological characteristic, we can better identify patients eligible for a treatment simplification strategy. So I will finish just with uh, two cases that uh, this is a patient that is a man 48 years old that uh, was uh, uh, discovered to be uh, seropositive in um, 14 September 2010 
and the clinical data at the first seropositivity was uh, very high viral load, more than 10 million, and so it was uh, understood that it was an acute infection, and after one week, few days, we were able to discriminate which was the viral load, and you see the viral load was 170 million copies. This is, again, a message. When we see very high viral load, it's very important to know which type of high viral load is. So we did also the resistant test before starting treatment, and you see that these patients are lucky for him. He had uh, um, primary resistant transmission for uh, an RTI and an NRTI. So this patient started a mega heart with raltegravir, maraviroc, tenofovir, FTC, and arunavir 800-100. You see, he needed, of course, almost one year to have a virological suppression because he started with a very high viral load. After he simplified with raltegravir, uh, tenofovir FTC, Darunavir, and after, again, he simplified the removing uh, raltegravir with tenofovir FTC, Darunavir, and after, for some years, uh, he just uh, make a monotherapy of Darunavir. But unlucky, after three years, uh, he had a viral rebound and a very high uh, viral load, you see. And this is what uh, happened. So if we compare the, vira, the virus that it was uh, before in 2010, you see that for the RT, there is some rearrangement. But what is more important, that this patient was doing monotherapy of Darunavir, and in this period, uh, he managed to accumulate all primary mutations that are important for Darunavir. So these patients failed to a monotherapy of Darunavir. That was uh, not a good solution because these patients had very high viral load at baseline and a multi-resistance virus. And so this was a consequence of emergence of resistance. What is happened one, one year later? So the patients started Olutegravir, FTC, Tenofovir, Maraviroc, and you see that still the patient is with 300 copy. So still it did not achieve the virological success. So it's very important to remember that treatment simplification should be designed with caution. Several factors can play a negative role on this strategy. High pre-therapy viral load, low CD4 cell count, resistance, and presence of blips. This is my last case about a female, 50 years old, risk factor heterosexual. She was positive from 99. And so you see that from 99 to 2004, she experienced all the drugs that were available at that uh, time. And uh, when uh, she failed with, again, with a viral load of 154,000 copy, you see that uh, sh um, this person has a resistance, especially on the RT, with uh, an NRTI and NRTI uh, mutation. So the patient started to be treated with 3TC, saquinavir, and lopinavir, double uh, protease inhibitors. And so this is uh, the situation on uh, February that the patient was viral load less than 50 and uh, there was no any more uh, mutations. And after started uh, several treatment with, first she make, uh, they make uh, the clinician a change to tenofovir 3 tc favirens and you see that he has uh, a high viral load. But after again with atazanavir, tenofovir, FTC, and after for many years uh, also again atazanavir and 3 tc and overall for 11 years uh, was uh, quite stable. But in May 2017, you see again uh, there is uh, a low level varemia, so around 100. And indeed we did the resistant test, and you see the appearance of the M184V that was not present in 2005 and was never present also before. So again, uh, these patients, uh, after many years of success therapy, after a simplification therapy to Atazanavir and 3TC, had an appearance uh, a low copy of the M184V. So in conclusion, we can say that there is an increasing number of patients that maintain detectable level of low, very low level varemia and can show blips of viral replication. And the presence of this low, very low level of varemia is, can be clinically relevant being associated with an increased risk of virological uh, failure. And uh, what is important that current genotyping methods can recognize uh, resistance also at low level varemia, also in the range uh, between 50 and 500 copy. And so the emergence of HIV drug resistance at low level is strongly associated also with subsequent virological failure. And so the resistant genotyping should be encouraged for HIV infected individuals on antiviral therapy 
also experience low-level viremia. And indeed, all international guidelines focus always on the importance of tailoring antiretroviral therapy to the individual patients on the basis of HIV genetic data integrated with clinical information, laboratory and therapeutic information, of course. So making a correct and prompt diagnosis is fundamental for a correct therapeutic approach in all patients. First, when starting the first-line regimen, at virological failure, independently of which low level of viremia or high viremia, and induced switching therapy that are under virological suppression. So I conclude you to thank for your attention and to say that it's very important the collaboration between virologists and clinicians. And this is a, an African proverb that say, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And these are all the collaborators to our group. Thank you very much. <laughs>